Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at Frank Turek attempting to tackle the Euthyphro Dilemma, and if I'm honest, that's all I really got for this in the way of introduction, Frank Turek versus Euthyphro. If you don't know what the Euthyphro Dilemma is, don't worry, it's going to be covered very soon. Let's go! Yes, sir. What's your name? I hate to end the night with this question. That's all right. <laughs> my name is Jacob. Hey, Jacob. All right. So uh, my question is about the um, Euthyphro dilemma. Yeah. Um, are moral acts willed by God because they are good, mm -hmm. or are they good because they are willed by God? Yep. That's the Euthyphro dilemma. At least, that is the form that modern Christian apologists like it in. If we go back to the original work by Plato, it is not so much a dilemma as a discussion on the definition of piety. Socrates was being charged with impiety, and Euthyphro is a character who claims to know how to define piety, so Socrates engages him in conversation with the hopes of learning something he can use for his defense. Euthyphro first defines piety as what he is doing. That is, he is in the process of bringing his father up on murder charges. Socrates points out that this is an example, not a definition. So, for instance, you can call helping the poor good, but helping the poor is not the definition of good. It is just an example of it. The second definition Euthyphro gives is that which is pleasing to the gods, for which the criticism is that what is pleasing to the gods cannot be the definition of piety because the various gods disagree on what pleases them. This is one that Christian apologists like to ignore because they are monotheists, so it doesn't apply to them, right? Well, Jesus often disagrees with the laws of the Old Testament during his ministry. Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone and turn the other cheek. The Old Testament God says stoning is the punishment for a myriad of crimes and eye for eye, tooth for tooth, fracture for fracture. And I know the apologist response is something along the lines of the new covenant or whatever, but just keep in mind that these are the same people usually that are arguing for an absolute unchanging standard of morality. There shouldn't be a new covenant that changes the rules. The rules should be the same for all eternity if they actually line up with an unchanging absolute standard of morality. The third definition is where the dilemma comes in. Euthyphro defines piety as what all the gods love, and what they all hate is impious, which I would take to mean that any areas of disagreement among the gods are morally gray areas, but that's not the point. The point is that Socrates follows this up with the question, do all the gods love the pious thing because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? He goes on to clarify, something that is being carried can be called carried, but that is only because it is in the process of being carried. The property carried is not an essential trait of that thing. It is a conditional state that the object is currently in. Then he brings it in a bit closer to the mark with the comparison to something being beloved. Is something beloved in and of itself, or does it not become beloved until it is being loved by someone? So morality is that which is loved by the gods, but the property loved is conditional. Something isn't loved until someone loves it. So piety can't be defined by what the gods love, because being loved is a conditional state which would make this definition circular. The fourth definition given is that piety is a species of the genus justice, which Socrates points out doesn't work because it is insufficiently specific. That means that there would be some things that are just but not pious, otherwise pious would have the same definition as justice. So that would be like defining even numbers simply by providing a definition of numbers, saying that even numbers are part of that group. You need to get more specific in order to actually understand what makes a number even. The final definition is that piety is an art of science and prayer, which eventually leads back around to the third definition of being stuff that pleases the gods. Now, I go through all this basically just to let you know that there is more to this than the typical is something good because God loves it or does God love it because it is good. But that is the only part of it that apologists ever address, and usually without getting into all the nitty gritty details, instead just saying, well, God is good because his nature is good, as though that actually answers the question in a meaningful way. Excellent question. Euthyphro is a character in a dialogue that Plato wrote. And the character says, as you just said, is it good because God does it, right? Or does God do it because it's good? If God does it because it's good, he's looking up at a standard beyond him to say, oh, that's good? Let me do that. 
Yes, if good is external to God, then all of the apologetic arguments saying that we know things are good and bad because God exists fall flat, because then there must be something outside of God by which we measure things to be good or bad, so God is unnecessary for this measurement to be performed. Well, if that's the case, why do you need God for morality? You got the standard outside of him. Exactly. And if God just makes stuff up, then God is arbitrary. Yes, if something is good simply because God says so, then that means that morality is ultimately arbitrary, which also makes the moral argument fall flat. Morality in this case is still subjective and arbitrary, it's just got a non-human subject who then implements his arbitrary morals through a policy of might makes right. Oh, he, he says rape is wrong now, but tomorrow he could say it's good, right? I mean, the perfect moral law recorded in the Pentateuch does explicitly refer to women as spoils of war. Best case scenario there, they're not being raped, they're just being forced into chattel slavery. But realistically, they were being raped. And it is allowed by the perfect moral code passed down to us from God through Moses. So yeah, God once said that, at least in some scenarios, rape was okay. So maybe don't choose an example where God has clearly changed his mind on the subject? Actually, scratch that, he didn't change his mind. I don't think the Bible ever explicitly condemns rape as anything more than just a property crime committed against the woman's father or husband. So no, he didn't change his mind, it's just still okay. And fun fact, apologists will often spin these verses about rape as not being about rape, because the Hebrew word used there has some ambiguity. So it might be about consensual sex, which, if true, would then mean that God thinks consensual sex between two adults is a a crime that is sometimes worthy of the death penalty, but rape isn't even worth mentioning. That seems pretty fucked up to me. That's almost like what Muslims believe about Allah. Yeah, almost as though their ideas about Allah are firmly rooted in the Jewish and Christian traditions. At least they have the guts to give an actual answer to the question if what you're saying about them is correct and not just a convenient jab at a competing religion. And this is supposed to be a dilemma for the Christian. Uh, in either way, you don't need God because you already have morality, or God is arbitrary. Now, the problem for the skeptic is this is not a true dilemma. This is what we call a false dilemma. But it's not a false dilemma, though. You appeal to God's nature as being good, but that doesn't actually solve the dilemma. It just uses sophistry to confuse the matter, which, come to think of it, is most of what apologetics is anyway. A true dilemma is A or non-A. Yes. A in this case being the standard of morality originates outside of God. So A is that God loves things because they are good. Not A would be that the standard of morality does not originate outside of God. In other words, it originates inside God. So not A is that things are good because God loves them. Those are the two options. If there is some absolute standard of morality, it can either originate inside or outside of God. Those are the only two options. Now, there are many potential options for the origin of morality that can be explored once we figure out the answer to this question, but it literally has to be one of those two options. The only way out of this as a dilemma is to concede that the absolute standard of morality does not actually exist. This is the third option, it's just that there isn't an absolute standard of morality. But apologists don't like that one because it kills the moral argument. Right? A false dilemma is A or B. Well, maybe there's a C. And in this case, C is that the absolute standard of morality does not exist. Maybe there's a third option, and in this case there is. God doesn't look at a standard beyond him and says, that's good, I need to do it. Because if he does that, he's really not God. That thing is God, okay? And God doesn't arbitrarily make up a standard. God is the standard. That's the third option. I just don't see how you even think that would solve the dilemma. If God is the standard, but he didn't make the decision to be that standard, then ultimately that means that something outside of God determined that God should be the standard, which then, for all intents and purposes, means that morality originated outside of God. Either that, or God did choose to be the standard, in which case God is arbitrarily deciding what the standard should be. So if God is not choosing morality, then that means even if his nature is the standard, it ultimately originated outside of God, making God a rather unnecessary middleman. 
The buck has to stop somewhere and it stops with God. Or the buck is an illusion and there really is no absolute standard of morality. So he's not looking beyond him. He's not inventing a moral standard. He is what we call justice, righteousness, and goodness. He is the standard. Let's hypothetically grant your nonsensical point for the moment. If that is the case, then how would we humans go about determining whether or not such a being actually is the source of morality? How do we determine that God is good if God is the standard by which we are measuring good? It seems as though our only way of making such a determination would be to compare the actions of this God with our opinions of good and bad. But then that is using our standard of morality, not his. So what do we do when God performs actions that we deem to be immoral, like genocide? What is the evidence? Uh, what is your evidence for that? That's another good question. The ultimate source of morality is this being for which we have no evidence that he even exists. We can only ever give philosophical arguments for his existence, but trust me, that's where your morals come from. Well, the evidence that this standard exists? Yeah, that would be a good place to start. Here we are arguing whether God is the moral standard or whether the moral standard is outside of God, and we haven't even established the existence of the moral standard. Is that the question? Right, like, yeah, that he is good. Or that, because, like, obviously he sets the standard of what is good. Well, we're, again, we're reasoning from effect to cause. Do we understand that torturing babies for fun is really wrong? Why for fun? I've heard this exact phrasing used by several apologists when talking about morality. There always seems to be the qualifier for fun afterward, as though the motivation of the person performing the act has an impact on the morality of the act itself. Would torturing babies be okay if the person doing the torturing didn't enjoy it? Is it because some sects of Christianity believe that unbaptized babies go to hell where God tortures them? Like, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, on their Frequently Asked Questions page on baptism, literally says that the unbaptized babies of believers might make it into heaven, or at least they think that they probably have reason to hope for that, but they don't dare hope that for the unbaptized children of unbelievers. So this is a not insignificant branch of Christianity whose official position is that God tortures babies for the crime of being born to non-believing parents and dying before being baptized. So is the for fun modifier necessary to cover for the fact that God tortures babies himself? Yeah, he does it, but he doesn't like it, so it's okay. Is that it? And, of course, there's also the typical apologist trope of going immediately to a large, obviously heinous crime to demonstrate that all people share the same moral code. They ignore any and all moral gray areas where the different people in different cultures have disagreements. Is it okay for me to lie to the scam artist who is calling me trying to get my personal information? Sometimes I do that. I play along as though they are fooling me. I do that to draw out the conversation because as long as they're on the phone with me, they're not on the phone with someone who might actually fall for their BS. Doing this frequently involves the telling of lies. I think this is morally acceptable. The people at Answers in Genesis disagree. They have a whole chapter in their Demolishing Supposed Bible Contradictions Book 1 dedicated to explaining why lying to a Nazi to hide a Jew is the wrong thing to do, because lying is always wrong under all circumstances. Why does my morality differ so significantly from the people at AIG's morality if there is one single absolute standard who can be known by the fact that he has written his morality on all of our hearts? Of course it is. Okay, if it's really wrong, then there must be something really right. And what we say is that is what we mean by God's nature. Now, we get this without reading the Bible. We already know that there must be a standard out there. No, we really don't. Individuals' moral codes vary, sometimes quite significantly. If we all agreed on one absolute standard of morality, that would not be the case. And as I've already pointed out, the Bible is a terrible place to go to for your morals. Uh, the question is, who is that standard? And then when apologists go on to answer their own question by saying, God, the more interesting question then becomes, if God is really the absolute standard of morality, then why do we find several of God's actions to be morally abhorrent? 
So many things in the Old Testament have to be ignored or waved away with inadequate excuses by apologists in order to make their points about morality. And most people ignore just how immoral the New Testament is as well. Sure, Jesus seems a lot nicer if you don't think about it too much, but if you actually read the books, there wasn't a hell in the Old Testament. Jesus introduced the concept of infinite punishments for finite crimes. If Jesus had not done his thing, I wouldn't be able to make my point about God torturing babies. And we get more information by reading the Bible. It turns out that the Bible says that the same being that created the universe is the same being who is justice, who is righteousness, who is goodness. This being just can't decide on some of his own rules that he wants us to follow. Should Hebrew women and children slaves go free in the year of Jubilee like the men do, or should they not? Well, if you're reading in Exodus, they should not. If you're reading in Deuteronomy, though, they should. And there are a lot of people who think that Moses wrote both Exodus and Deuteronomy, but somehow he wrote opposite policies into his parallel laws. So you can argue from a philosophical pers perspective, from knowing that torturing babies for fun is wrong to this being, or you can look at the Bible or both. Okay. Can you point me to a Bible verse that says torturing babies is actually wrong? Like a specific verse? Because I can point you to one that says not beating your child with a weapon is wrong. The closest you can get to a condemnation of that is the verse where Jesus tells his disciples to let the little children come to him so he could lay hands on them and pray. But as the Bible says to beat your children with a weapon, the implication here is that even though he says they belong to the kingdom of heaven, it's still okay to beat them. Otherwise, he would be saying that the author of Proverbs was wrong when he said that. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Gerald March, who says, Who else trips to the rhino? It's hilarious when you go from a logical state to just staring at the background. Yeah, I briefly toyed with the idea of not using my weird backgrounds and just doing something like, say, Professor Stick and having a plain white background or black background or something like that, or maybe finding a picture to use or recording footage of my various fish to use in the background. But not only would none of those things really fit the channel style, I mean, it just seems weird to be a rhino surrounded by fish, but I also realized that I would immediately lose my loyal fan base of stoners who just get high and zone out while watching the backgrounds. I don't know how many of you there are, but I know there's at least a few. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the moral standard that is the nature of my channel. If you'd like to not actually solve the Euthyphro dilemma while pretending smugly that you have, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.